Thanks, guys. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you here this morning. I have to say I'm really nervous about this morning's meeting. Uh, I wasn't here yesterday. I was away preaching somewhere else. And, uh, but preparing for this morning has uh, been an interesting experience for me. I've, I've known I've been doing this meeting for quite a long time. And those of you who are preachers will know when you're preparing back from a meeting, it can be, well, I don't know what way you do, but I work back from particular meetings and I've been planning this meeting for probably the last six weeks or so, I would imagine. And I want to share with you just a little bit of testimony before I get into what I believe God wants to say. I've been reading just before I get into the actual message. If you turn with me, if you need your Bible this morning, turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. I want to show you something here that is really important. My theme really this morning is to be sharp, to, to sharpen yourself, to get yourself sharp. Whether you're talking about an axe or a sword, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both. But we've got to be sharp. We're entering an era where we need to hear the voice of God. It's no good just doing something because it's a good idea. And it's no good just doing our missionary work, wherever that is, whatever country that's in, just because we've always done it and we're expected to do it. And we come back to a missions conference and people pray with us and we go back and we do it again. We need to hear more from God. We're in a very strategic time of history when we need to be hearing from God. There's an interesting story. It happens twice in the Bible. Bible. Once, well, it's the same story but recorded twice. Once in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and you'll find the same story in 2 Samuel chapter 5. But Chronicles is a little bit different. Chronicles is written chronologically. It's written because the writer wants us to understand that there is a process that, that has a beginning, that has a middle, that has an end. And I just want to introduce my message with this. That what happens in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 is the story of the ark being brought back to Jerusalem. And David has conquered Jerusalem. He wants the ark there because the ark symbolizes the presence of God. And David desperately wants the presence of God. You'll find that after he brings the ark back to Jerusalem, he gets all the people, he cries out to God. There's a wonderful prayer there recorded in Chronicles where he says to the people, You who rejoice, seek his face. Come on people, seek his face. And the whole key theme of David through the Psalms is to seek the face of the Lord. Right. And we need to seek his face today. But when Chronicles is a little bit different from 2 Samuel chapter 5, because in 2 Samuel chapter 5 it talks about an interesting experience that David has with the Philistines. Where he goes out to, to the valley of Rephidim and he fights against the Philistines. And he says to the Lord, Lord shall I go and attack them? And God says go and attack them. Then a little bit later, the same enemy, the same valley, the same people, the same army, of his army, comes. the enemy comes against him again. He again seeks the Lord and says, Lord, what will I do? And God says, I don't want you to go against them. I want you to go round behind them and I want you to wait until you hear the, the stirring in the mulberry bush. You know that story? Now that's in, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, then in 2 Samuel chapter 6 it talks about the ark going to Jerusalem and there's a guy called Uzzah who puts out his hand to stabilize the ark and God kills him on the spot because he's touched the holy of holies, touched the ark and David's annoyed, David's upset. And that's the way it is in the book of Samuel. But in the book of Chronicles, it's slightly different. Because the story starts off in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and it talks about Uzzah. And then we have 1 Chronicles chapter 14, where it talks about the Philistines. And then we have 1 Chronicles chapter 15, where it talks about it being brought to Jerusalem. And that is very strategic. The reason for that, I believe, is that David sought his face. He, he, he turned towards the Lord to seek his presence and to seek his face. And because he did that, when he faced the Philistines, he heard the sharp word of the Lord speak to him. I believe it was, it was intentional. He intended to spend some time with the Lord. And because he did that, God gave him such a clarity in hearing the voice of the Lord. That then when he brought the ark back to Jerusalem, he said, guys, come on, we've got to seek his face. Because if you seek his face, you will find him. Those that seek him will find him. Right. Now, just to give you a little bit of backdrop to where we are. I was in Jason's church and uh, Russ's church uh, last November, and uh, an old, uh, I call him an old guy, came up and spoke to us, it wasn't Russ, uh, uh, and an old guy came up and, and spoke to us after the men's breakfast, and, and he said something to Jason and I that had a big impact on me. He said, I learned something years ago, and I wish I had learned it as a young Christian. 
And he said that God had brought him into a place where he had learned to fast and pray. And what God had shown him to do was to tithe his time, to take three days in every month, and to fast and pray and seek the face of the Lord. He said it's changed his life. So I said, and Jason, we said together, we're going to do that. And so I've been doing that. I've done my first one. I go back to my second one. I'm taking three days every month. I'm not saying this to you so you think it's impressive. Not at all. I'm sure you fast much longer than I do. But what I'm saying is this. At the beginning of this year, I took three days. But I said, God, I'm going to seek your face. And I want to hear from you. And so I took that time, set the time aside. And yet last year was a difficult year. 2015 was very busy for me, but it was a difficult year. Physically, it was difficult. The meetings I've had have been phenomenal. The travel I've done to different countries has been wonderful. Meetings just have been great. But physically for me, I've been suffering with my sacroiliac joint that's affected my back. And because it, part of it is because I spend so much time in airplanes, I spend so much time on the road, and I spend so much time on different beds. And I came to the Lord at the end of the year in this three-day fast. I said, Lord, I met maybe 2016, maybe I'll find me a church and settle down somewhere. <laughs> or maybe I'll, I'll change what I'm doing. Maybe it's time that I saw the younger guys. Some of my best friends have just retired. They've done 30 years in the police and they've retired. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? A young guy like me, this guy same age as me, he's retired. And so it, it, it's coming through my mind, do I need to slow down a bit? And I started this three days of fasting, went out, the first day was a Sunday, went down to church and BAM! I was hit by God right in the middle of the first chorus, which was a Bethel chorus that says, make me brave. And talks about going out into where the waves are crashing over me. And I felt God said, listen, this is not a time to hold back. This is not a time to retire. This is not a time. This is actually a time to extend what we're doing, to be busier about the work of the Lord. So I want to tell you a word from the Lord this morning, folks. Missionaries especially, if you've come here and you think you're entering the last part of your missionary life, just get a life. It's only beginning. You're going to have to extend more than where you have been up until this moment on of time. So be encouraged this morning. You're going to run faster. You're going to go further. You're going to do more in this next year than you've ever done before. Is that okay? Yeah. Kathy's going to come and read some scripture to me. I, in this few days, God brought me to a few passages of scripture that I want Kathy to read to you this morning. The first one is Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 1 to 7. And I'm going to be speaking. My idea for the next half hour is to speak on, on being sharp. 2 Kings 6, verses 1 to 7. And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please, let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make a, there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. And then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, an iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. And therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. And then Joshua chapter 15, verse 16 to 19. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kiriath-Sephor and takes it, to him... I will give Aksa my daughter as a wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa his daughter as wife. Now it was so that when she came to him, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted from a donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? And she answered, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. 
And then 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 16. Saul, Jonathan his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Mishmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned onto the road to Ophrah, to the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road to Beth Horon. And another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe and his sickle. And the charge for his sharpening was a pin for the plowshares, the mattocks, the fours and the axes, and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people of, who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Mishmash. Thank you, Mishmash. I'm not sure how you say that, but there you go. You know, it said uh, one of your presidents, Abraham Lincoln, has famously said in the past he was a, an axe man before he became president. And he said, if you give him, if, if you give, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four hours sharpening the axe. The Bible gives us a way of sharpening. You'll know Proverbs 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And this conference is about sharpening. It's about coming to a place as missionaries, as people who love missions, and being sharpened one with the other. We sharpen each other. The strengths in me will sharpen the weaknesses in you. The, the, weakness, the strength in you will sharpen the weaknesses in me. As I spent some time with the Lord over these particular passages of Scripture, uh, God started to speak to me. And on one particular night, I, I didn't plan this, I had a strange experience, and I'm sure you have some strange experiences, but I had one that, that woke me out of my, my bed. Something came across the room in my room, and it was about half past one at night, and, and something came across my bed. I, I could see it, but I didn't know what it was, and I wasn't frightened, and I, I had experiences that have frightened me, but this didn't frighten me, so I assumed it, it was something to do with the Lord. I put the light on and woke Kathy, I didn't, didn't intend to wake her, but she woke when the light went on, but it was so real that, that I, I felt it was the presence of God. I had no idea what it was. Didn't come with a name badge. But God downloaded some stuff straight into my mind about this meeting this morning. And I want to share that with you. One of the things that God said to me was in these three passages that Kathy has read to you. One of the things that's most important, God's told me that this morning I would be speaking, I believe to everybody, but particularly to those of you who are the sons of the prophets. To those of you who did not start the ministry that you're in or that you're going into. To those of you who were not the pioneer or the originator of your dream, but you've carried on the dream from perhaps your father, your mother, your family, or perhaps another minister, I don't know. But I believe God said to me that this message particularly, and these three passages, I saw it so clearly. The first one that Kathy read to us in, 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 with Elisha, it says it was in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, the sons of the prophets. And then we have in Joshua chapter 15, it wasn't Caleb that asked for an extra feel, it was Aksa. His daughter, who he gave his wife to his nephew. And then in the third one, where it talks about Jonathan, in the next chapter that Kathy didn't read, it says there that Jonathan was the one who went and fought, even though God didn't even speak to him. He was the one who fought against the Philistines. The sons of the prophets. And the word that God wants you to hear this morning is the place where you dwell at this moment is too small for you. God wants you to know that the place where you dwell is too small and it's time for you to extend your borders. 
And within this passage, in each of the passages, we see the relationship between the pioneer and the one who would follow. In the first one that we read in 2 Kings chapter 6, where, where the prophets, the sons of the prophets said, this place is too small for us, they said, let us go. It could have been very offensive to the older guy, Elisha, when, when the young man says, your ministry is not big enough for me. That could have been a very offensive thing for this man of God to hear. But he's not offended. We see that Elisha says, go my, with my blessing, you go. And then you see the wisdom of the young people. They said, well, will you please come with us? So there's a wonderful transition there in the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 6. And the man of God said, I will go. Then we see in, in the story with Caleb and his daughter Aksa. Caleb was the one with Joshua who was full of faith. But when he hands out land to his family and to his daughter, his daughter talks to her husband, his nephew, and says, Listen, this land isn't big enough. We need more room. And he grants her request. The only one really who flops the transition is the King Saul, who in the passage we read in 1 Samuel 13, if you read in 1 Samuel 14, you know the passage where Jonathan says to his armor bearer, let's go up and uh, let's fight the Philistines and God will, will fight for us. And he asked for a certain sign. But the only thing that could, the man of God could do was he sat there with the priests, with the Ark of the Covenant, with, with his weapons. And all, his, his only response to Jonathan doing something that he felt inspired to do was to have a roll call. That was all that he could do. There's interaction between the generations. We need to make room. We need to make room in our lives. God had been speaking to me last year about this, about making some room. That's why I've set these three days apart because God will work in the space that we give him in our lives. I found something interesting in the second passage about Aksa, the, the daughter of Caleb, is that, I don't know if you've thought about this, but I felt God showed me that she, when she asked him for the field, she said, I want the source. Yeah. Or she said, I want the springs. The springs talk about the source. I was once in, in the Philippines, first time, I, second time I went to the Philippines, I went with another minister and we, we were with a missionary and traveled up into the mountains in, in the, the uh, north part of the Philippines. And when we stopped once, we were with some uh, native Filipinos and they stopped by a river up in the mountains and one of the guys got some, a, 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 a bowl or a, or a cup and he, he drew some water for us to drink. Now, thankfully, the man that I, the missionary I went with, had brought our own water on the Land Rover that we drove in. Because I noticed that further upstream, some caribou were standing in the river. And they were, I don't know how you say it over here, they were urinating in the water. And the water that he was drawing out, it was flowing down past the place where he lifted up the top. How many of you know that's not a good idea? So I needed to get closer to the source, the other side of where the caribou were. Because the purest water is closest to the source. I used to enjoy, uh, my, my brother particularly liked hi-fi and he used to buy some expensive hi-fi. And if you go into a hi-fi shop and then you say to them, I want to buy a system, where should I put my money? They'll say to you, listen, you've bought your source. So if you want to get a CD player, you want to get, I don't know what you want to get, if you say it's a CD system, you, he, they'll say to you, you put most of your money into the CD system because the source is the most important. Don't ever use the leads that come in the box. Buy good quality leads. Then you work on your amplifier. Then you work on your speakers. You always work out from the source. And that will give you the purest hi-fi. That's just a rule that people do in sound and it works. She said to her father, I don't want to copy you. I want to get to the source. I want you to give me the springs. The same springs that you got your revelation from. But I don't want to be a photocopy of your ministry. I want to find my own supply from the source. 
And this morning, if we're going to be effective ministers and missionaries who extend our border, we've got to get close to the source. Because that will sharpen our swords, that will sharpen our axe. The further we get away from it, I see all the time, I hear preachers and I think I'm hearing T.D. Jakes. Now, I love listening to T.D. Jakes, but I can't stand the wannabes. Tell the same stories, tell the same jokes. He gave her the upper and lower springs. And then in the passage, and all I'm doing this morning, this is a very disorganized message. I'd love it was point one, two, three. I'm just giving you what I believe God revealed to me. Is that all right this morning? I believe these are fresh from God. I want you to look at that passage that we read, that Kathy read in 1 Samuel 13. Because the first thing in that passage, it says in verse 19, 1 Samuel 13 and verse 19, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. You should never go to the world to sharpen your sword. If you do, there will be a cost. If you get your tools sharpened by the world, there will be a cost. Let me tell you this, and you can write it down and you can take note of it. The world will only sharpen what is no danger to itself. The world cannot sharpen your sword. It will only blunt your sword. There is an offense in the gospel. Jesus said that. In fact, Jesus as a preacher turned people away. Not intentionally, they just went. In fact, he wasn't a very popular preacher of some of his ministry. When we look in John chapter 6, it says many of them turned away when he started talking about the cross and started talking about the price. He didn't end up with a great crowd and he spoke to his disciples and said to them, do you want to leave me as well? And Peter said, where will we go? Now we can learn much from the world. We can learn many tools and many tricks and many things that will help us in our ministry. But the tools that God has given to you were meant to be sharpened by other children of the kingdom and not by the world. Oh, you can get them sharpened. But if you get them sharpened by the world, you will pay a price. Because the world doesn't sharpen them for nothing. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? You can interpret that how you like. You can have the biggest church in this nation if you want to. If that is your aim, then go and sharpen your tools in the world and you will end up with one of the biggest churches in this nation. If that is your dream, if that is your desire. But God doesn't want us to sharpen our tools in the world. Because the world will only sharpen what is no danger to itself. So your communication skills, sure. Your dress code, sure, if you want to. Your car, sure, if you want to. The home that you live in, sure, if you want to. But the Word of God, no. Because the world will intentionally make dull the Word of God in your life. And I don't care if you're the trendiest preacher in the world. I don't care if you've got people buying your books. I don't care if you've got more followers on Facebook than anybody has. If you sharpen your tools in the world, you will pay a price for it ultimately. And we see that price along our, across our nation because the church in America and the church in Britain are not changing the nation. The world is changing the church. Because we've gone down to the world to sharpen our tools. 
And I believe God wanted to say to us this morning, there is a way to keep sharp. There is a way to sharpen your sword. As iron sharpens iron, so our brothers and our sisters will keep us sharp. And that's why we need a conference such as this. That's why we need to keep together, to contact together, to keep your Facebooking together, whatever social media you use, whether it's email or you're on one of the social media sites, it doesn't really make any difference. We need to be sharpening each other and calling each other to, to account. Because it's the time you spend sharpening that comes with your brethren and the time most of all sharpening that comes from the presence of the Lord that will cause your blade to cut right to the place that God wants it to go to. You see, when you read the story, it says there was no blacksmith to be found in the land. No blacksmith. Now we, I, whenever I'm up in Quitman, they tell me, I, I talk about putting a spade in the ground. And I can't remember whether it's a spade or a shovel now, David. What is it? What do you dig up the ground with? Is it a spade? A shovel, okay, a shovel. Well, we use spades over in England, but a shovel's fine. You have to have a sharp edge on it if you're going to break through hard ground. But what's happening is, when we get into 1 Samuel 14, is that they've got sharp tools but blunt swords. In fact, they haven't even got any swords. And when the day of battle comes... There might be a lot of spades, but no swords. And let me tell you, you don't need a spade, or a shovel, sorry. You don't need a shovel on the day of battle. When the day of battle, we need to discern the times. There's no need for a sharp tool on the day of battle. You need a sharp sword. All sowing and reaping stops on the day of battle. So they've got sharp tools, but blunt swords. And we have this young man, Jonathan, who, as a young man, wants to achieve something, wants to do something. But there's an interest, and I don't know if you like word studies. I love the Word of God. I love the way the Word comes through. When you read, I read in the New King James Version, it says that when he climbs up, you know, it gives you the names of the two rocks, Moses and something else. As he climbs up in 1, 1 Samuel chapter 14, it says that he climbed up two sharp rocks. I find that very interesting. The, sharp, the, the rocks were sharp, but the tools were blunt. Jesus said one day, he says, if, if you don't praise me, the, the rocks will cry out. And they will praise me. And then we see some tremendous, after that, the, the victory that God's, God wins is, is absolutely amazing. There's trembling in the camp. We need to keep our swords sharp. And this conference this week is an opportunity for us to sharpen our swords. And that needs commitment from me. It needs commitment from you. It needs commitment to each other. And it needs commitment to the Lord seeking His face. Because when we seek His face, we will find Him. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning. I find God tremendously close over this last while. And I, I believe the secret is spending time with him. But to be honest, I was so busy doing the things, doing my ministry, doing my missionary work. I'm busy this year. I'm busier than ever this year. But I've marked in my diary the, the days that I've set apart to seek the Lord. And I will seek the Lord during those times. Fasting. Fasting is a key, not because you're impressing God by doing without food, but fasting is a key because you're taking control over your body and you're saying, body, I'm going to discipline myself. And we need to learn that in this age. I love the gospel of grace, but the amount of time people talk about grace today and use it as a cover to do whatever you want. I don't want an empty head or an empty heart standing behind any pulpit. I don't want to hear a man of God or a woman of God impressing me by what they've read or impressing me by what intelligence. I couldn't give a hoot. I don't need that. The time that I spend listening, because most of my time I'm giving out, the, spend, the time I spend listening, I want you to give me a word from the Lord. I don't want you fiddling about with your latest technology. I'm not interested in your smartphone or your smart anything. 
Though all that's good, by the way, I have an iPad and an iPhone. And I love them. But I'm not impressed by them. I need to stand in the pulpit. And I need to hear from God. And I want to speak to the younger ones today. Those of you who, who didn't start the ministry you're in. But you've got it. It's yours. I want to say to you this. You're not just following in tremendous footsteps. You're doing that. But God isn't going to photocopy what went before and allow your guideline to be a repetition of who you took over from. God would say to you this morning that this room that you are in is too small for you. That actually you need to spread out to the right and spread out to the left. That not, might not mean a physical. It might not mean a moving. It might be in a different ministry. It might be to concentrate in a different area of ministry than your father or your forefathers did. It may be that an, an emphasis that God is giving to you that is not an emphasis in who you took over for from. But I believe God particularly wanted to emphasize you in this meeting at the early part of the conference this week. I guess that's why he woke me up. That it's the sons of the prophets. That it's Aksa. I've never preached on her in my life. I, I couldn't have told you her name. If I'd said to you, what's Caleb's daughter's name? Would you have known? I wouldn't have known. Her name's Aksa. Never preached on her. But she doesn't re repeat what her father said. She says, I want, I want to get closer to the source the same source that you're from, but I want to draw wells from the, the wells of salvation. I want to draw from the source. But it'll be different than Caleb did. Different land than Caleb had. Jonathan, he, <clears throat> he stretched out in a new way. And God did in a tremendous amount in his ministry. So this morning, I've not been very long. But I've just delivered to you what God delivered to me. Amen. I believe I've heard from Him. I believe it's straight from Him. And I believe we need to take note of that this morning. Do never go to the world to sharpen your tools. I'm sick of trendy meetings. I can buy a Hillsong CD and stick it in my car. I don't need to hear you playing the same guitar solo or starting in the same way or finishing the same way. Get a life. Now they're wonderful, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing the source. I'm criticizing those of us who hit the photocopy button. Because it's easy. Costs very, very little. What God wants us to do this morning is to go to the source and to dedicate our time to finding Him. And I can promise you that those that seek Him will find Him. And he will reveal his word to you. And we need it. In this nation, you need it. You need to know what to be praying this year. You don't know who your, your new president will be. And we can prattle on forever about our favorite, about uh, Donald Trump or about Hillary Clinton. You can, you can shout till the cows go home. But let me tell you, you need to know what God is saying. And you won't find that by listening to Fox News. You won't find that by sharing some idiotic thing that somebody puts on Facebook. You'll only find that in the presence of the Lord. And God will speak to you in the presence of the Lord. He will give you his rhema word in the presence of the Lord. So let's make these pulpits, let's make our leaders, people who know what it is to hear the word of God. Because we'll know, you won't have to tell them I heard from God, although I told you this morning. But something will resonate within you that starts a new trend of not just trendy haircuts and tattoos, but we'll start a new trend of people who will spend time hearing from God. And I know you want to be that person this morning. And I want to be that person this morning. You're very kind. I want us to pray. Just let's close our eyes for a moment. Lord, speak. God speak. Lord, we want to give you permission. Just give him permission today to shut you up. To shut me up. I'm a talker. Oh my word. If I could get paid just for talking alone, I'd make a fortune. Give God permission to shut you up. Give him permission to, 
Spend time. But listen, you're going to have to be intentional about it. The amount of people who say to me, Oh, Kingsley, must get a coffee sometime. Never happens. I'll say, get the diary out. Let's put it in. Tuesday week, 10 o'clock. See you there. Outside Starbucks. Come on. Whether we've got a red cup or a cup that sings jingle bells. I don't care. Let's be intentional about our time with the Lord this morning. So you need to get your diary. Look through your diary for the next year. I have my diary planned for this year. Look through your diary. Set aside those days. Listen, if you don't, they won't happen. Because something will happen. Some emergency will happen. Some other person will want you. The grandchildren will want you. Tell the grandchildren to stay away for a weekend. Hello? God didn't create you to look after your grandchildren. Though they're beautiful and yours are the most beautiful. God created you to spend time with Him. So Lord, I pray this morning for all of us, we give you permission. Help us this year to be men and women who will seek after God. Who will find you. Will hear you speaking to us. For those young ministers, maybe not young, but people in a position that they did not start. Lord, I pray that you will cause them to extend their ministry. That they will get hold of the springs that they will increase and that they will achieve great things for the Lord. In your name we pray. And all God's people said Amen. 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 we got to keep moving this morning. But I believe that God can move very quickly and very powerfully in a short amount of time. Yeah. And I believe God's going to Seal this word in our hearts. And he's going to help us hear from him. Amen. Amen. So Kingsley, would you just walk down the line and pray for us and bless us? Yeah. I didn't work this back, by the way. Please believe me this morning. This isn't work back from knowing that there are young ministers here. God woke me up to tell me this. And so I'm going to pray and I'm, all I'm going to do is walk down the line and just, touch, just to see that. And, and the Bible says not to lay hands on men suddenly. But there is something that happens in the laying on of hands. And all I will do is just see that. So I'm just going to touch you after I pray. And then let's go away and just take that as the sealing of what God has done. Father, I just pray for each one here this morning. And I just pray your blessing on them. Lord, as I lay my hands on them, I pray that you'll seal this word. And that God, as, as Matt said, give them permission. To, to extend and to do what you've told them to do. I release you in Jesus' name. You do what God has told you to do. You go to the source. And you will find the source. It doesn't matter what age you are. How young you are. How experienced you are. We seal this word in Jesus' name. And we say go and do what God has told you to do. Be released in Jesus' name. Go and achieve what he has called you to achieve. It may be different. You may be afraid of, of what changes you've got to make. Listen, the Lord will, will, wants to say to you, he can, he can do this. He can do this. He will make a way. He will prepare the way for you. Don't worry about men's faces, what they will say or what they will think. And so we seal this this morning. And we expect to see amazing miracles from this moment in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kingsley.